save these people. Well, once again, I get to follow her. <laughs> well, good morning. Welcome to Grace. And we're going to continue our series of messages called, What are the Odds? What are the odds of these things happening? Uh, we've been preparing our hearts for the greatest celebration in Christian history. The day in which Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we celebrate his resurrection from the dead. And uh, we're, we're looking at the prophecies from Isaiah 53. So if you would, you can turn your Bibles there. But I'm going to have that verse on the screen here. But later I'm going to share with you uh, to turn to Matthew, uh, Matthew's account. So you might want to just jump over to Matthew uh, chapter 27 because I'll have the... Uh, I'll have the prophecy that we're going to be looking at on the screen for us all to read together. So before we do so, let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for caring for us and showing us your incredible, amazing love by going to a cross to die among criminals for our sins and then three days later rising from the grave to prove who you are. You are the victorious one over the grave and sin and death. You are the God of, of all ages, and you want to be the God of our lives, the Lord of our, Lord of our lives, so that we would trust you, that we would follow you. I pray that you'll open our hearts and minds today to your word, to you apply it to our hearts, that you'll speak in ways that um, your Holy Spirit will speak in ways which I can't. Lord, we pray that you will meet with us here today as we worship you and learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's message is, as he was counted among the rebels, or counted among the criminals, or counted among the villains, what are the odds that God's anointing, anointed would be there, would, would fulfill some kind of prophecy like this? The final verse of Isaiah 53, verse 12, is an interesting verse, because up until the point of Isaiah 53, 12, we hear all the majesty of the Messiah, all the things that the Messiah is going to do, all the incredible things. But then we start reading in the last verse of this, and we find out that the Messiah, God's anointed one, is going to identi identify himself with the lowest of lows, the very lowest of all humanity the Messiah is going to identify with. If you would, um, go ahead and let's go to that next verse. And if you would, read with me Isaiah 53, 12, okay? Ready? Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he, is, he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins, a sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah's prophecy of the Messiah kind of ends with a twist. Up until this point, like I said, we see all the majesty, all the marvel, all the incredible aspects of the Messiah. But then at the very last, there's a spin. And it really shouldn't be too much of a surprise to most of us. Because we who know the story, we know how Jesus died, we know that it happened, just as he said. But why would God's anointed be counted like a criminal and then die alongside other criminals and be compared to twice in this verse to the word transgressor? Why would he do that? You know, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise because... If we know the story of Jesus, we celebrate it at Christmas, we know that his birth, his beginning here on earth, not his physical, not his actual beginning, but his humanity beginning, begins with a twist. Jesus, the Messiah, the promised anointed one, wasn't born of noble birth. He wasn't born in a palace or among the kings and queens of the land. He was born... In a stable, in a cave, likely. He was born with no uh, pomp and circumstance. He was born, you know, of a humble birth. Not even a bed to lay his head on. Probably straw and swaddling cloths. And those that come to visit him at, at his birth 
are not the nobles, they're not the kings, it's not the, the up-and-coming people of the day. No, it's the lowest of the low, it's the shepherds that visit him at his birth. So it shouldn't be any surprise that if he begins his life with the lowest of lows, that he will end his life here on earth with those very same people, but yet even lower than the shepherds. How could God allow his son, the anointed one, be counted in his death among the criminals, among rebels? That's what we're going to talk about today. The lowest of the lows is where, we, where Jesus finds himself at his death. And 700 years before this happens, Isaiah predicts it with incredible accuracy. It's found in all four Gospels that he dies among two thieves. God's anointed, and his will was that God's, his anointed would be counted among the transgressors. We're going to be talking about that here in a little bit more. But it's just, it's amazing that his, this verse begins with such uh, incredible prophecy, and yet it twists at the very end. The verse begins, chapter, uh, chapter 53, verse 12, begins sounding like what a conquering king would do or a conquering general would do after a battle. Verse 12 begins very much like, well, a general is going to, after he's defeated his enemy, he's going to divide the spoil. He's going to divide those that he has now defeated in battle, and he is going to celebrate his victory. And that's the way the verse begins. But then it twists, he, and it says the reason that he's going to be able to divide the spoil is because he was poured out, excuse me, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Twice in that last part of that verse, it mentions the transgressors. It's an interesting word in Hebrew, because in the Hebrew language, transgressor sounds like, oh, these are just sinners. But that's not really the depth of that word. The word really has to do with the insurrectionists, the rebels, those that would intentionally break the law. A transgressor is someone who breaks the law, but you can accidentally break the law, right? You cannot know what the law is, and, and you can break the law. But when you intentionally break the law, you're an intentional transgressor. That's what this word means. It's, it's found about 40-some times in the Old Testament. And most of the time, it always refers to those that intentionally break either God's law or man's law. That is what this verse is talking about. Jesus, God's anointed, is going to be identifying himself in his death with those who intentionally break the law. Isn't that amazing that it would be that accurate 700 years before? And I know that for those of us who grew up in church, those of us who know the story of Jesus, we know that that's exactly the way all four Gospels describe Jesus' death on the cross and Jesus' last, uh, last day. And yet for us, we say, yeah, we know that happened. Yes, we know that's true. But imagine that you're hearing this story for the very first time. The very first time you've heard the story of Jesus, let's, let's say that I could magically wave you know, my hand over you and erase all your knowledge of Jesus. And I tell you that God one day will send his Messiah. His Messiah will come, give his life as a ransom for our sin, and, and a wonderfully uh, celebra- uh, take care of our sin, and we can celebrate his life in, uh, in heaven because he rose from the grave. And yet I miss the story of him dying on the cross among two thieves. And if I were to add that last twist, those of you who would hear the story for the first time, you would probably say, what? What? Did, why, what? He died on the cross, but he died among criminals? Why would God allow his chosen anointed one to, not, to die with the lowest of lows, among criminals? Why would that happen? Why would God allow it? And I would be here to say to you, or I'm here to tell you, that the reason God did that is because he wanted to make sure there was no confusion of the prophecy. There was no confusion of the accuracy 
of Isaiah's prophecy 700 years before that if anything could go against all human odds, it would be that God's anointed would be executed. He would give his life among the lowest of low criminals, which just is bizarre. And that is why I think God did it. So let's, let's look at what are the odds that God's anointed would be counted among villains or rebels or criminals. Whatever you want to put the word there, these are, not bad, these are not good guys. These are bad guys. So I want to talk about that. What are the odds that Jesus would be compared to Barabbas? I would love, and one day I hope, to preach a sermon. I've, I've preached it like four times so far in my ministry, about Barabbas and Jesus. I am going to not do that today because we don't have that much time. But there is a fascinating comparison between Jesus and Barabbas, and I'm going to just touch on that a little bit today, give you a little taste of that. What are the odds that Jesus would be crucified between two criminals? If, if Just think, if we were going to make a prophecy about a coming king, 700 years before, what would be the odds that that prophecy would include these two bizarre facts? I think it would be highly unlikely. And as we compare Jesus to these criminals, these villains, these scoundrels, these rebels, I want us to just continue to take in the awe, the majesty, and the amazement of Scripture. So if you've turned in your Bible to Matthew chapter 27, we're going to begin reading, or I'm going to begin reading in verse 15, and we're going to actually look at Matthew's historical account of what happened in Jesus' last few hours. Matthew was a Jewish tax collector. He was hated by most of the Jews because he was actually, he was working with the Romans to take money from his own people, the Jewish people. But he became a follower of Jesus, and so he's going to tell the story of the Jesus, the, the Jewish Messiah, the one who came to take away the sins of the world, and he's going to write to his fellow Jewish people from a Jewish perspective. So when he begins in verse 15 and he mentions the feast or the festival, he's naturally assuming Every good Jewish person is going to know what festival or feast he's talking about. Because every good Jew, Jewish person, knows that the best, the greatest festival is Passover. And so that's why he naturally assumes he doesn't give them, it doesn't say the feast of Passover. He just says it was the feast time. So let's look at verse 15 where Matthew wrote these words. Now at the feast... Again, that's Passover. The governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. It's a key. It includes that. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate asked them, and he's asking the crowd, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who's called the Christ? For he knew, and that's Pilate, Pilate knew that it was out of envy that they, the Jewish leaders, had delivered him, Jesus, up. Pilate knew their intent. He knew the, the ploy. He knew what the plan was by these Jewish leaders. Pilate was no fool. And again, I think Pilate has been, in history, he's been vilified. He's been pointed out that Pilate could have released Jesus, and it's his fault that Jesus went to the cross. And yet we're going to see in the actual truth of the story is that Pilate knows exactly what's going on. He is no fool. He knows who and why they're doing this. But before we get to Pilate, let's talk about Barabbas. Who is this Barabbas? And again, I would love to spend an entire service sermon on this, and I have, but I won't today. But I do want to describe to you and paint a picture for you about who this Barabbas is. All four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mention Barabbas by name. All four of them have a slightly different way of describing him. Matthew says he is a notorious criminal. However you want to use the word, whatever word you want to use, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John's description, 
he is no nice guy. He is a bad guy. He is a very, very bad guy. If they had uh, the top 10 most wanted in Palestine at that time, he would have topped the list. He would have been number one. He would have been the worst guy that you could possibly put on a wanted poster. That's who this Barabbas is. And I know most of us in church, we've heard of Barabbas, but we really don't know how bad this guy is. In the most ancient manuscripts of Matthew, there's not many of them, but there are several of the most ancient uh, 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 documents of Matthew. Before his name, it is Jesus Barabbas or Jesus whom you call the Christ. And that's what Pilate says. Who do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? Jesus of Nazareth. I think that's fascinating. And again, for us today, we are centuries removed. Yeshua, Jesus, it was a common Jewish name. If I were to say Joshua, was it Joshua Barabbas or Joshua the Christ? then we would all say, oh, I, I've heard, I know a lot of Joshua's. Joshua is the English translation of Yeshua, or the, the one who would save, or we call him Jesus. It's a common name in Jewish terminology or Jew, Jewish culture. And so it wouldn't be surprising that he would be named uh, Joshua or Yeshua, Jesus, Barabbas. What about this term Barabbas? We think his name is Barabbas, but I would, I would submit to you that is really not his name. That is his nickname. Just like Jesus the Christ, the, the promised one, Jesus of Nazareth, that's his kind of description. Jesus Barabbas, Barabbas means in Hebrew, son of a father. Many commentaries believe that when Again, not only is this guy the most notorious of the land, he was probably the son of a famous rabbi. And as we know, uh, son of a father, he is someone of renown, both in the Roman culture and the Jewish culture. He was not only notorious, but he was famous because they knew him. What about this guy? He was a Jewish insurrectionist. He was a rebel. He and his crowd, his group, his his gang, were trying to overthrow the Roman control in Jerusalem. They had done all kinds of things to cause problems for the Romans. They had even murdered people and stolen from people. So when it says they're criminals, they are thugs. They are the bad of the bad. All right? So clearly, he is much more of a threat to the Romans than Jesus of Nazareth, wouldn't you say? What has Jesus done to overthrow the Romans? Nothing. He's healed people. He's, he's, he, if he's done anything, he's just made it difficult for the Jewish people. He's not done anything to overthrow the Romans. Pilate, when he's in conversation with him, in John's account, Pilate even asked him, Are you the Christ? What, where is your kingdom from? And Pilate says to them, to the crowd, I find no fault in this man. Look at verse number 19. Besides, while he was sitting, and that's Pilate, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him having, and says, Have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and, the word is there, destroy or kill Jesus. The governor again said to them, that's Pilate, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. 
And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released, and that's Pilate, released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. There is so much in there that I, I'd love to go into detail, but I just want to skim the surface and let you see for yourself what the Scripture says. Pilate says over and over again, I find no fault in this man. This guy has done nothing to deserve capital punishment. And he washes his hands in front of them, symbolizing, it is on you, it is not on me. If we read other accounts, the Mark, uh, Mark Luke, or John account, we'll see that they say, if you don't release Jesus, uh, excuse me, if you don't release, release Barabbas, then we will tell Rome on you. Well, who's the threat? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus of Nazareth to the Romans? Clearly, Barabbas was their threat. But they twist the entire story and say, if you don't release Barabbas, then we will tell Rome on you. And Pilate was already on pretty shaky ground with the Romans anyway. And so that's why out of self-preservation that Pilate does what he does. And he says, okay, you want, you want to do this? Then it's on you. It's not on me. Pilate clearly wanted to set Jesus free. And the crowd clearly chose Barabbas, the biggest threat to the Roman Romans in that area. And think about this. Three crosses were, prepared, were prepared before that day. Three crosses were prepared. What cross did Jesus bear? His own? Barabbas's. He took the cross that was prepared for Barabbas that day. Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse number 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters they gathered the whole battalion before him. And again, we sometimes miss that, pe that piece. This is not a small gathering of these soldiers. This is a whole battalion that they gather uh, Jesus before. And they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they put on his head uh, the crown of thorns and put, the reed in his, put a reed in his hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spit on him, and they took a reed, the reed that they had put in his hand, and they struck him on the head with it. And when they had mocked him, and they had stripped him of the, of the robe and put on his own clothes on him, they led him away to crucify him. They went out, and as they were going, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And we know why, because we know that of the, of the punishment that Jesus had endured up until that point, he was no longer physically strong enough to carry his own cross. So they, they press Simon into carrying the cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it, because it was of a medicinal purpose to deaden the pain or lessen the pain that he was in and about to endure even further. They divided his garments. Oh, excuse me. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among, among them by casting lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him. This would be common in the Roman uh, day that they would put the, the law that the criminal had broken over his head on the cross. And this is what they put on Jesus' cross. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. That's why he's being crucified. That's the law that he broke. He broke the law that he was king of the Jews. And remember, if you know the other accounts, you know that the Jewish leaders say, oh, no, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. Say that he says. And Pilate said, no, no, what I have written stands. You're crucifying him because he is, king, he is your king. Then it says, the last verse, verse 38 says, when, then, then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. These other two robbers, I would absolutely probably go to my grave believing that these are the two compadres of Barabbas. Remember, three crosses were prepared that day for the three most notorious criminals of that time. And these two were thugs alongside Barabbas. 
And that's the one, that's the two guys that Jesus hangs between. My second point is this. Why would God allow his son to be regarded as a criminal? An awful, terrible, humiliating, degrading way to die. There is nothing humane about it. There is nothing dignified about it. I know we've seen the pictures and we see the little loincloth across his middle. That is not that is not accurate. That is not historically accurate. They would strip the people bare naked. They would hang there for all to see in their, in their openness, in their shame, and in the humiliation that that would entail. It would take days for most people to die of crucifixion, not hours. It was a long, painful, suffering, and agonizing way to die. And why would God allow his son to die like that? Why would he allow his son to die with criminals? The first point is this, because he wasn't one. We know that he, is, he was the only one to, to live an entire life, human life, sinless. To fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53, 12 is the other reason. He was not a criminal, but he had to die like this because that's what Isaiah said, and God would not, he would never disavow his own word and it was prophesied and so it had to happen the second thing is the reason he did this is because you and i are one you and i are no we may not as be as villainous as barabbas and these two two robbers and i understand that compared compared to these two guys i don't i'm looking across i don't see any of you that have ever made it america's most wanted I don't see any of you saying, you know, your, your name is right up there with Dillinger or, you know, anyone else. But we've all committed crimes. We've all broken God's law. We all deserve the cross that Jesus hung on. We are, we are the criminals. And yet, the reason that Jesus died on the cross is so that he could identify with us. That he could show us that no matter how far we go, he went lower. Now, think about this. Several years ago, most cities in the United States put up, you know, those traffic cameras at every intersection, right, or major intersections. Before those traffic uh, cameras went up, many of us, I won't identify any of you, but, you know, I'm just saying, many of us went through traffic signals, lights that were red, and we went through thinking, oh, don't see anything in the rearview mirror, no red lights, no blue lights. I must have gotten away with that one. Sometimes we went through by accident. Sometimes we were in a hurry, and we didn't come to a full stop. And so we kind of ran through that or rolled through that red light, right? And before those traffic cameras, we always felt like, ah, oh, I got away with that one. Nowadays, we have those traffic lights and whether we thought we got away with it or not, sometimes we get surprised by this little card that comes in the mail, and it says, go to this website, look at yourself, you violated a traffic signal, right? Has any of you ever received one of those? I think some of us have. You see my hands up here, too. And it's like, no way, I didn't do that. I came to a stop, and I watched the video, and it's like, yep, I rolled right through that one. But there's two ways that we can look at these things. The first way is that when, we, when we're caught, we can deny it, like I tried to justify just then. No, I, I came to a complete stop. You know, I, I don't know why I'm getting this ticket. I, I, I stopped. You know, we can deny that until we see the actual video because what they send you is the still picture, and then you click on it, and then there's a video that's about 10 seconds long, right? We've seen those, and then it's like, yeah, I'm guilty. We can either deny it or we can accept it. You know, and what's, what's sad is a lot of times, you know, people feel like they can break God's law, and God's not watching, God's too busy, and oh, I got away with that one, and, you know, I don't get any punishment for it. There's no immediate, you know, uh, consequences of my sin. Therefore, I got away with it, and it's all all going to be all going to be fine but God's camera is always watching us God's camera always knows our heart intent and our actions 
There's the other side of this, though. And the other side is that we, some people, for the smallest infraction, beat themselves up saying things like, I'm worthless, I'm awful, I don't deserve God's forgiveness. How could God ever care about me? How could God ever forgive me of what I've done? So whether you deny your guilt or whether you beat yourself up, both of those are wrong. And the reason why is because of what we're seeing right here, which is the third reason. The reason that Jesus died on the cross between two thieves, two criminals, is because he wanted us to know no matter how low we think we are, he went even lower. Jesus came down to our level to bring us up to his. Matthew recorded that Jesus' comparison to these two villains, these two criminals, his crucifixion demonstrated that no matter how low we go, no matter how bad we sin, there is always even more grace, more forgiveness in the Son. Right? That is what it demonstrated. All four Gospels record this truth. All four Gospels demonstrate that Jesus did this even while on the cross forgiving the one criminal. And again, we think that he was just a thief, just a robber. But as I shared with you before, he was a bad guy. He, has done th- he did things far worse than any of you that I know here. Now, maybe you've done things I don't know about. All right? And clearly, Jamie, I've shared with you this morning, there's things that I've done that you don't know about. We've all done things awful. And yet, God's forgiveness would stoop even to the lowest of lows of any of us. In fact, that's what Paul understood. Paul, who identified himself chief among all sinners. Think about that. That's how the Apostle Paul described himself. And he understood this, and that's why he wrote about it in Philippians chapter 2. So I want to encourage you to flip over to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to finish the rest of this message from, from that passage. Because in that passage, Paul is going to describe just how far Jesus went to forgive us, to die on the cross for our sins, and just how far up he wants to take us. Are you found Philippians chapter 2? If you have, let's look at verse 5. Where Paul said this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, th- though, in the f- though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's where he started. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And Paul there describes the depth in which Jesus went for each of us. How far would he go to demonstrate his amazing love for us? So I want to talk about that for the, for the remaining part of this message. Jesus began fully God. He was fully God in eternity past. He was fully God when he came to earth. But when he came to earth, he also became fully man. So let's look at Jesus' descent. How far did he, where did he start and where did he end in his descent? It says in verse 6, it says that he thought equality with God, nothing to be grasped that. He started equal with God. And can you imagine in eternity past that God the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit would have a conversation knowing what humanity would do about sinning and rebelling against him. And then they would have a conversation in eternity past and they would say, clearly one of us is going to have to go down there and die for him. And Jesus the Son volunteers, I'll go. I'll give up part of this Godhead, of this deity, I will give it up for a time to become like one of them. Give up some of my deity. Now, I didn't say he'd be giving up his deity. He'd give up some of his power, his majesty, all the omnis that the the father has, the son has, and the spirit has. Can you imagine the angels looking on and hearing this conversation and thinking, you're going to do what? The son is going to leave heaven and become one of them? 
one of those scoundrels, the ones that are going to intentionally disobey, you're going to become one of them? Jesus says, yes, I will. That's how far I will go. And so it says that he emptied himself of some of his deity. In verse 7, that he laid a portion of his deity aside, some of his power, some of his majesty. He willingly laid it aside for a short time to become like one of us. In verse, in, uh, verse 7, the last part of that verse, he took on human form. He became like us. That's what we call the incarnation. God the Son took on human flesh. He walked around this earth like us. He thirsted like us. He talked like us. He hurt like us. He needed food like us. He needed shelter like us. In all ways, he became like us and yet sinless. What a big step to go from the splendor of heaven, the right side of God the Father, to a manger where no one would visit him except the lowest of lows, the shepherd. That's how far he came. Think about it. He, according to Scripture, he never possessed a home. He never possessed any kind of animals. We would say today he didn't have a car, didn't have a house. He had nothing. That's how far Jesus came. Nine months, I'm sure the angels looked down, and it, it took them nine months to see what was going on in Mary's womb. It took them nine months to, to realize this is a good thing, that he's going to become like one of them. He will understand them, and they will understand him, and for the first time, they will understand how far the Father loves them, that he would give his own son for their sins. They would understand that for the first time. So much so that at his birth, the, the scripture says that a multitude of heavenly hosts shout in a loud voice, glory to God in the highest. Right? So God the Son became human. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Not just a human. Not just a human. I mean, he could have been born in a, in a palace, but he didn't. He became a servant, is what Paul says. And, and his entire life he spent serving people. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but can you imagine everywhere Jesus went on his ministry, people wanted him to do something for them. Feed us, cleanse us, heal us, care for us, take care of my mother-in-law for me. You know, all those things. Jesus, do something for me. His entire ministry was a ministry of servanthood. And he became a servant, Paul said. Not only that, but he humbled himself to what we were talking about here. Now, I know that Paul doesn't clearly describe this right here, but you're going to see that he does include this. He humbled himself to a criminal status. And I know that Paul doesn't clearly point that out, but just bear with me. The sixth thing that he shows is that he became obedient to the point of death. And that is kind of a unique way of translating what's actually there in the original. Because it doesn't mean he came right up to the point of death but didn't die. That's not what it means. It says that he became obedient all the way to death. He died. The Son of God died. That is really a better way of understanding this. He died. How in the world could an eternal God die? Unfathomed, right, to the human mind. But yet we know he did because he was human. And then the, the final thing that Paul says, he became ob obedient to the death on a cross. And this is where the understanding of how he died as a criminal comes from. Again, I shared with you before, you know, Matthew is writing this to a Jewish audience. They knew what Deuteronomy 21, 23 says. Deuteronomy 23, uh, 21, 23 talks about how that any Jewish person who would be hung or crucified on a tree is cursed. And so it would be incredibly degrading, humiliating, and awful for a Jewish person to die either by hanging or or by crucifixion. And yet, that's what Jesus did for us. No one would have ever believed that God's anointed would be 
killed in this way, would sacrifice himself in this way. But yet, you know, the saying goes, you know, what goes up, what starts up must go down. And what, but the Bible says what starts down must come up. And so I want to look at Jesus' ascent. Because in verse 9 of chapter 2 of Philippians, Paul wrote these words, Therefore God has highly exalted him, highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, the, of God the Father. So think about this. He starts co-equal with God. And he goes all the way down to dying a humiliating death on the cross. And yet, Paul doesn't leave him there. Because that's not where Jesus belongs. And that's not where any of us belong that have trusted Christ. And he says, God will lift him up in verse 9. That God will lift him up. Therefore, God will highly exalt him. Again, it's one of those explorative's. In, in, uh, in Greek, that it's just not exalt him, but he will highly exalt him. He will push him as Barabbas was number one most wanted. Jesus will be number one most exalted. He will be highly exalted. The second part of verse 9 says that God will give him the greatest name, a name above every name. In verse 10, every knee in heaven will bow. And every knee on earth will bow. And every knee under the earth will bow. And every tongue will confess him as Lord. You see where Paul takes Jesus is from here to here and then all the way back up. That every person, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, it does not matter. Everyone will confess him as Lord. And then verse 11 says, to the glory of the Father. It'll all be to glorify God. People will confess him either as Lord in celebration for their salvation, or they will confess him Lord in disgust and disdain for their eternal punishment. But either way, everyone will confess Jesus as Lord one day. So, Jesus went down, down, down. And yet God took him up, up, up. And the reason he took him up, up, up is so that no matter how low we go, no matter how far we get away from from the Lord or his word or his instructions, no matter how many laws or rules we break, if we will come to him in forgiveness, he will forgive us. No one is too far out of his grace or too far that can't be reached. I wish we could share all the stories that people I've seen that come to Christ that you would think no way it'll take it'll take heaven and earth to melt down before they'll ever trust Christ and yet years go by God begins working on them the Holy Spirit begins tugging at their heart they accept Christ and their life is changed that is what this message is about that what are the odds that God would do this well the odds are pretty good from his perspective But from our perspective, the odds are pretty far-reaching that he would do something like that for you and me. Today, I want to just challenge us all with just a a simple conclusion. It doesn't matter what level of criminal sinner we are. If we've not yet trusted Jesus as our Savior, we are just like Barabbas and these other two rebels that hung on the cross. We are that far away from him, and yet... We're not outside of his reach if we yet trust him. Today, I I, want to challenge you to break down the barriers that you might have put up to let him in. Let him into your heart. See how far he's gone to prove his love for you. Let him step in and remove your sin. Give him your life. Trust him and then live your entire life for him. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming down to us to become like one of us and even further than like us to the lowest of lows to demonstrate that you care that much, that you would be willing to die among criminals because of your love for us. 
Lord, I pray that if there are people here today that have never yet trusted you as Savior, that you'll begin tugging on their heart, that you'll begin moving in their, in their soul to want to trust you, want to realize how great your love is. If some are here today and they've trusted you before, but yet they've fallen away and not lived for you like they should,